my thinking uh, in Christian apologetics like our speaker tonight. I remember coming as a, as a fresh student uh, here to Charlotte, and my very first semester, my very first class, was with Dr. Geisler. And one of the joys of learning is to learn how much you don't know yet. And uh, it's a little unnerving sometimes to see how much there is to know. And uh, anyway, Dr. Geisler has inspired me to think um, carefully about God and about uh, the faith. Dr. Geisler has authored or co-authored 79 books and hundreds of articles. He has taught theology, philosophy, and apologetics on the college or graduate level for over 50 years. He has served as a professor at some of the finest university, at the finest seminaries in the USA, including Trinity Evangelical Seminary, Dallas Seminary, and Southern Evangelical Seminary. Tonight, Dr. Geisler uh, is going to speak on the topic, I believe the Bible, but if God, why evil? So help me welcome Dr. Norman Geisler. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming out uh, tonight. This is one of my favorite uh, topics. Can you hear me in the back? Very good. Great. This is one of my favorite topics, and uh, anyone who's thought anything about reality has to ask the question, uh, if God, why evil? Uh, why the Holocaust, if there's a God? Why tsunamis, if there's a God? Uh, we put it all in the book. There are a few copies in the front here. If God, uh, why evil? Some time ago, it just won uh, the uh, Book of the Year award in its category uh, from a uh, magazine that uh, rates uh, books on that topic, and uh, we're really happy for that. Uh, there are three basic responses to this question: If God, why evil? Uh, pantheism, which affirms God and denies evil, say so, yes, there's a God, but evil is not real. Uh, Shankara Hinduism, Christian science, um, evil is just maya, it's just an illusion, it's just a, a zero, it's a nothing, a dream. Atheism, on the other hand, affirms evil and denies God. Uh, it's, it's clear that evil exists, but it's not at all clear that God exists. In fact, uh, the two seem to be incompatible. And then, of course, theism, which says uh, both God and evil exist, and then it struggles to try and explain why uh, that is the case. So let's uh, say uh, a word about each of those before we go into detail here. Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy wrote Science and Health with the key to Scripture. God is all. Therefore, all that really exists is in and of God. Evil is but an illusion and has no real basis. It's all in your mind. It's not only mind over matter, but matter doesn't even matter. It doesn't even exist. Like a teacher asked his uh, class, what is matter? And one student said, never mind. And so he said, well, what's mind? He said, no matter. Uh, that's uh, what the pantheists uh, say. Uh, someone wrote a poem on it. There was a pantheist of Deal who said that though pain is not real, yet when I sit upon a pin and it punctuates my skin, I just like what I fancy I feel. So the problem uh, for pantheism uh, is in explaining uh, why does evil seem so real? In fact, uh, where did the illusion come from? Why do we all have it? And uh, why can't we get rid of it? You can usually get rid of it an illusion, pinch yourself and wake up, as it were, uh, but we can't seem to be get, able to get rid of evil. C.S. Lewis, uh, once an atheist, uh, uh, summarized very well the problem of atheism and evil. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. And I started asking myself, how had I got this idea of just and unjust? Man does not call uh, a, a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own, but if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. He said I was in a dilemma. Um, either I had an objective moral basis for complaining against God, or I didn't. If I had an objective moral basis for complaining against God, 
then there must be an objective moral law, and every moral law has a moral law giver, so that led me right back to God. If I didn't have an objective uh, basis for complaining against God, then it was only my own private idea and was no basis for an argument. Actually, evil cries out for God in three ways. One, to explain how we know it's evil. Uh, how do we know it's not good unless we knew what good was? How do we know uh, it's unjust unless we knew what just was? And if there's a, a moral law that says you ought to be just, then there must be a moral law giver. Secondly, evil cries out for God uh, to comfort us in our sorrow over evil. Nietzsche, the uh, famous, most famous atheist who ever lived, uh, said, uh, people like Spinoza have comfort in their uh, sorrow and comfort in their loneliness. Uh, I don't have any whatsoever. He bemoaned the fact. And then finally, uh, how do we know that things are going to get better? Most people believe that they're going to get better, but what grounds do we have? If there is no God, how can we be assured of an ultimate victory over evil? Maybe evil will win in the end. Maybe we'll be on the losing side. So really, evil cries out for God in at least three, three ways. But the problem for a believer in God is this. Uh, God is all good and opposes evil. God is all knowing and he foreknew evil was going to come. God is all powerful and he can't defeat evil. Uh, why then does he permit it? Uh, how can an all good, an all knowing, all powerful God, an all good God who opposes it, an all knowing God who foreknew it, an all-powerful God who could defeat it, uh, why does evil uh, exist in that kind of universe? I want to try and cover four aspects of the problem tonight. Uh, the nature of evil, uh, the origin of evil, the persistence of evil, and the purpose of evil. There are many other aspects, but uh, we can't do it. We uh, do those in the, uh, in the book. First of all, let's talk about the, the nature of evil. What is evil by nature? The problem is this. If God created all things, and if evil is something, it's real, because uh, the theist doesn't believe, as the pantheist, that it's unreal, uh, then God must have created evil. So we're in a real dilemma. If God created everything, and evil is something, then uh, <coughs> God must have created evil. If we want to uh, deny the minor premise, evil is something, uh, uh, we become a pantheist. Uh, and then we have all the problems associated with that. Uh, if on the other hand we want to say God didn't create all things, then uh, we're in a dualistic uh, universe where God himself is uh, struggling and we don't have a theistic God, we have a, a finite God like Plato's Demiurgos or Rabbi Kushner's uh, God who uh, isn't all perfect and isn't all powerful. So it's a serious problem. How, do, how does a theist answer that? Note, if both God and evil are real, then how can Christians deny one or two and three follows from them? Uh, and the answer comes from St. Augustine, 400 AD, a, a brilliant Christian thinker. And uh, he was thinking about this uh, problem for many years because he was in a Manichaean cult that believed that good and evil were dual principles uh, in contests with each other forever. And Augustine said, I agree that God created all things, but I do not agree that evil is a thing. It's not a substance, it's not a reality in itself, but rather it's a lack or a privation or a corruption in a good thing. And if evil is not a thing, then of course the argument doesn't follow. Uh, the conclusion being, that God did not create evil. Let me illustrate uh, why evil is not a thing. Evil is kind of like rot to a tree. You have to have a tree to have rot in it. Uh, evil is like rust to a car. Unless you have iron, you can't uh, have rust in it because it exists only in uh, that metal. Evil is like moth holes and wool. You can't have uh, a moth hole unless you have some wool to have the moth hole in it. Evil is like an amputation in a body. You have to have a body there in order for uh, it to be maimed or amputated. So evil doesn't exist in itself. It's, a, it's an ontological parasite. It exists only in some other 
uh, being, not in and of itself. Problem one, uh, if evil is a corruption or a privation in a good thing, then uh, it's not real, because a whole is nothing. Uh, response, it's a real lack in a good thing. Being blind, uh, being deaf, and being lame are real. Just close your eyes and walk around for a day. It's a real lack of sight. Uh, being maimed is a real lack uh, of having all the, of your limbs. So evil is not uh, a real thing in itself, but it's a reality that exists in real things as a privation or corruption of them. Problem two, if evil is the absence or negation of good, then evil is just a negative. But evil is really a positive reality. It's not just a negative reality. So isn't this uh, wrong because it reduces evil to a mere absence or uh, a, a negation? The answer is evil is not an absence, it's a privation. What's the difference? Uh, an absence is only something that's not there. For example, a stone doesn't have sight. So sight is not in a stone. It's only absent. It's not a privation because the stone isn't supposed to see, so it doesn't lack anything that by nature it's supposed to have. Privation is something not there that ought to be there. Uh, ought to have two arms, but one is missing. It ought to have two legs, but one is amputated. For instance, sight is merely absent in the stone, but the, uh, the stone, uh, uh, but the stone is a privation in a human uh, because uh, nature, uh, humans are supposed to see uh, and stones are not supposed to see by nature. Now, a very important note here. Evil does not exist in itself, but only in another. It's like a parasite. It doesn't exist in itself, but exists in something else. Nothing is totally evil in a physical sense. Something might be totally evil in a moral sense, but not in a physical sense. For example, a totally rusted car is no car at all. What would it be? A brown spot on a pavement. Uh, a totally rotten tree is no longer a tree. What is it? Topsoil. Uh, you can't have anything that is totally privated, because if it's totally privated, it's not there. What's a totally moth-eaten garment? A hanger. <laughs> in the closet. Uh, it's not there at all. So evil is a privation in something else, but if the thing is totally privated, it doesn't exist at all because evil doesn't exist in and of itself. Problem one, what about uh, Satan in the Bible? Uh, is he, is he uh, not totally evil? Doesn't the Bible describe him as a sinister, deceiving, conniving, totally evil uh, uh, person? Answer, he is totally evil morally in what he does, but not metaphysically in his being. According to the Bible, he was a, a perfect angel like that God created, an archangel who rebelled against God, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 3, 6, pictured in, in uh, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. So he's totally evil morally in what he does, or totally evil intentionally in what he intends to do, but not metaphysically because he has a, a good being, a good mind, a good will, good powers that were given to him as he was created by God. Problem two, what about total depravity? Does the Bible teach that we're totally depraved? Answer, we're totally incapable of achieving our own salvation, the Bible says, but we're not totally depraved in a metaphysical sense or we wouldn't exist. We exist and have minds and have wills, but we're totally incapable because we're fallen human creatures, according to the Bible, totally incapable of initiating or attaining our own salvation. Problem three, what about poison? Isn't poison completely evil? No, every chemical in poison is good. Every molecule is good, every atom is good. There are no evil chemicals in, in uh, uh, poison. And as St. Augustine put it, a poison uh, were evil in itself, then the one that would suffer most from it would be the snake. Uh, but it doesn't. Evil uh, is something that exists in a good thing, but uh, there is nothing that is evil in itself. 
Well, if that's the nature of evil, if God created only good things and uh, these good things ended up with some privations or lacks or corruptions in them, then where did they come from? What brought the corruption in it? What brought the lack? Uh, what is the origin of evil? Well, the problem can be stated this way. If God is absolutely good, uh, and a good God cannot create anything that is not good, and a good creature cannot do evil, therefore evil cannot arise in such a world. But evil did arise in this world, so uh, either God is not absolutely good, or he didn't create absolutely good creatures. Because if he's absolutely good and created absolutely good creatures, they wouldn't have been able to do evil. Uh, that's the dilemma of the origin of evil. St. Augustine, again, in his anti-Manichaean writings, uh, uh, answered that uh, problem with what has become known as the free uh, will defense. Uh, evil did arise in this world, uh, hence either A or B is false or both, and what we're going to say uh, is to challenge one of the premises. Uh, God is not absolutely good and or God did not create good creature. Uh, we're going to accept the first premise uh, because the Bible says he can't even look on evil, Habakkuk 1, 3, in his presence the angels sing holy, 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 Isaiah uh, 6, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. God is absolutely good. In fact, you wouldn't know something wasn't good unless you knew what was absolutely good because you have to measure it by a standard uh, beyond it. So we can't reject the first premise, so we must challenge the second one. God did not create a good creature. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, after almost every day it says it is good, it is good, it is good, and after the last day it says it's very good. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 says God made man upright. Uh, we were made perfect creatures. Lucifer was made a perfect uh, creature. How then did evil occur uh, in a perfect universe with perfect creatures uh, made by a perfect God? Um, the answer, St. Augustine said, is that God is absolutely good. God cannot create anything that's not good. That's for certain. Uh, and a good creature cannot do evil is a false premise. Uh, and it's a false premise, said St. Augustine, because a good creature can do evil. The premise is false, hence the conclusion does not follow uh, from the premises if the premise is false. Why is the premise false? How can a good creature created by an absolutely good God do evil? St. Augustine says it happened this way. God created only good things. One of the good things God created was free will. You never see anybody marching against freedom. Back to bondage. Uh, I want to do everything my mother ever said. Nobody marches against freedom. Everybody marches for freedom. And if perchance sometime you should see people marching against freedom, they freely chose to do so. So they're really using their freedom and experiencing it and enjoying it uh, to argue against freedom. Freedom is a good thing. But free will makes evil possible. Why? Because it's the power to do otherwise. It's the power to do otherwise. But to do otherwise than good is evil. Hence, a good free creature can do evil. In other words, God made evil possible by making free creatures. But we make evil actual by using our freedom. In other words, God made evil possible by making free creatures. But we make evil actual by using our freedom. Henry Ford made every accident that's ever happened on the highways possible by mass producing uh, automobiles. And I come from Detroit and used to work on those assembly lines. Uh, but he didn't, uh, he's not responsible for every accident. He made evil possible, but we make it actual. God made evil possible by creating a good thing called freedom. Free will makes evil actual. We're responsible for the use of the freedom. Problem one, how can one uh, will evil when there is no evil to will? Now this is the problem of when God made 
the angels, and they were perfect, and one of them was called Lucifer, how could he possibly do evil? He didn't have any evil in his nature. He had no evil in his environment. There was no evil in his source, God. Everything that surrounded him was good. How can one will <coughs> evil, Lucifer, for example, when there was no evil to will? Augustine's response is evil arose when a good creature, called uh, Lucifer, with a good power of free will, when it's good to be free, will the finite good of the creature over the infinite good of the creator. In other words, no evil needs to exist in order to will evil. Willing a lesser good can be an evil. You say no evil needs to exist. How can evil be committed if there's no evil there to commit? The answer uh, to that is that evil is created by a will. Uh, it doesn't have to be there. It becomes something that exists when a free will brings it into existence. Uh, James Orr, the great apologist, said, uh, evil was born in the breast of an archangel in the presence of God. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, or 3, 6 says, uh, don't put a novice in office, lest being lifted up with pride you fall into the condemnation of the devil. Isaiah 14 depicts it beautifully when uh, it says, I will become like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, the five I wills of uh, Lucifer. So evil arose when a good creature with a good thing called free will will the finite good of the creature over the infinite good of the Creator. So now we have, um, in answer to the nature of evil, it's a privation and a good thing. There are no evil things. We have the answer to the origin of evil. One of the good things with good free will brought this corruption, privation, uh, into uh, the universe. Then the question uh, arises, why didn't God stomp it out right there? Why didn't he just uh, uh, nip it in the bud? Why does evil persist? And this next argument is perhaps the most powerful argument an atheist has ever used against God. And most atheists use the argument from evil against God. And, and it goes this way. If God is all good, he would defeat evil. If God is all powerful, he could defeat evil. But evil is not defeated. Just look at the newspaper, the television, or look in the mirror, for that matter. Evil is not defeated. Therefore, no such God exists. Now, notice the conclusion isn't necessarily atheism. It could be finite godism. It could be a God who is not all-powerful and or not all-good. But certainly an all-good, all-powerful God can't exist if evil does. Therefore, theism, which is what the Christian claims, uh, would be false. How do we respond to this very powerful and very uh, logically tight argument? Well, we can't reject the first premise. If God is all good, he would defeat evil. Of course, uh, he wants to do that. If he's all powerful, he could do it. If he's omnipotent and all powerful, he certainly could overcome evil. But evil is not yet defeated. You see, the non-theist forgot a very impor important word in the third premise, uh, yet. Evil is not yet defeated. Now the conclusion doesn't follow. Therefore, no such God exists. Why? Because evil might yet be defeated. Today, tonight, tomorrow, next year, a thousand years from now, doesn't matter. If it's possible that evil can yet be defeated, then it's not impossible that an all-powerful, all-loving God uh, exists. Now the atheist uh, doesn't take uh, this answer Lying down, uh, he has a retort. His retort uh, goes <coughs> uh, this. Uh, the new problem, if God is all good, he would defeat evil. If God is all powerful, he could defeat evil. But evil never will be defeated. It has never been defeated to this point, and we have no reason to believe that it will ever be defeated in the future. Evil never will be defeated. Therefore, no such God exists. Now, this is a logically tight argument. In fact, the conclusion follows. No, all good, all powerful God exists if evil never will be defeated. 
and evil has not yet been defeated, and we have no reason to believe that it ever will be defeated. Uh, therefore, we have no reason to believe that any such all-powerful, all-good God exists. Now, there's no way for the objector to know that premise C is true unless he's got it. How can you know for sure that evil never will be defeated unless you have all knowledge of all future states of affairs? If you have all knowledge of all future states of affairs, you can say for sure that evil never will be defeated. But if you're omniscient, then you have to be God in order to argue against God. So the argument presupposes that the objector has the standpoint of omniscience to know that evil never will be defeated. And there is no way for the objector to know this unless he is God uh, himself, in which case he posits God in order to defeat God. Uh, the response, if God is all good, he would defeat evil. If he's all powerful, he could defeat evil. But evil is not yet defeated. Therefore, what follows from those premises is that evil one day will be defeated. Why? Because if God is all good, he wants to. If he's all powerful, he can. And if it's not yet done, just hang on. It's coming. Evil will one day be defeated. How do we know? Because the nature of God it's, uh, himself demands that answer. An all-loving, all-powerful God wants to do it and can do it. The nature of a theistic God is the solution to the problem, but seems to be the problem itself. If he's all-powerful, he can do it. If he's all-good, he wants to do it. Hence, he will do it. How do we know? Because he's all-powerful and all-good. And he wants to and can. If he wants to and can, it's not yet done. It will happen. If it hasn't happened to date, it will happen in the future. Well, how can God defeat evil because, you know, uh, because uh, this is a universe with free will. People can do what they want to uh, do. They can choose what they want to uh, choose. So how can evil be defeated? Notice I didn't say destroyed, because to destroy all evil, you would have to destroy all free will. And to destroy all free will, God would have to destroy something in his creature that he gave them. He'd have to renege on what he gave them, and that makes them like him. Uh, so he allows everyone to freely choose their destiny. Then freedom is preserved, because nobody is forced to do anything. Everybody is free to choose their own destiny. And here's how he defeats evil. Separate, eventually he has to separate evil from good. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow until the harvest. Uh, there will be good fish and bad fish, there will be good and evil to the end, but eventually they have to be separated. Why? What is it that frustrates good people? Evil. What is it that frustrates evil people? Good. I used to work on the assembly lines in Detroit, and you know what uh, frustrated me? They're swearing, cursing, telling filthy stories, blowing their smoke in my face all day long. I was frustrated by their evil deeds. You know what frustrated them? Me. I had my Bible. I was witnessing to them. I was sharing Christ with them. I was uh, uh, memorizing verses from the Bible. So the only way you can solve that problem is there has to be a place where there's no more evil to frustrate good people. The Bible calls that heaven. solve that problem is there has to be a place where there's no more evil to frustrate good people. The Bible calls that heaven. And there's no more, has to be a place where there's no more good to frustrate evil people. The Bible calls that hell. Separating good from evil forever by quarantining them forever. You got to quarantine evil or it's not controlled. You can't let evil continue to corrupt the good. Uh, so evil has to be separated. The Bible calls that hell, uh, where they're separated f forever. By punishing evil and rewarding good. We have prisons here. Uh, every rational society has a way to reward good and punish evil in some manner or another. 
you have to do that or uh, you're not really uh, acting in accordance with good if you're good or evil if you're evil. By defeating death and Satan so that uh, there can be no more frustration by the end in death, and death is the ultimate evil that happens to us in this life. Uh, when was that done? According to uh, the Bible, it was done officially at the cross when Christ came the first time, when he de defeated evil. Uh, it will be done actually at the second coming when Christ returns again. How do we know that? Well, there are almost a hundred predictions in the Old Testament of Christ's first coming, and they were all literally fulfilled. So we have no reason to believe that the ones in the New Testament won't be literally fulfilled. So if he came and officially defeated it with almost 100 predictions, uh, then he will come and actually defeat it at the second coming. And so the hope is that an all good God, an all powerful God who wants to and can, has a plan. The first stage of the plan is already accomplished. The second stage is yet to come. The official defeat of evil on the cross and the actual defeat of evil later. Colossians 2.14 says that on the cross he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made us show them openly, triumphing over them. He triumphed over the powers of evil. He went, 1 Peter uh, 3, uh, 19 talks about him going and announcing the victory of his resurrection to uh, the underworld. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 says this, For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that power of the death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What is the ultimate frustration? Death is the ultimate frustration uh, for us. Christ reversed it. How? By his resurrection. There's more evidence that Jesus died and rose from the dead than there is any event from the ancient world. We have more manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, better manuscripts written by more contemporary eyewitnesses confirmed by more historical archaeological data than any event from ancient history. If that's the case, then Christ did officially defeat it and he will come back and actually uh, finish it. When will that be? It's called the second coming. Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, in righteousness he does judge and make war. The armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Uh, John said in chapter 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, should be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's the actual defeat of evil. So if the nature of evil is a privation, the origin is free will. <coughs> um, evil persists because he has to allow people to freely choose, so he ultimately has to bring it to a conclusion uh, because he can't allow the frustration to go on forever. Then we have to ask, what was the purpose of all of this uh, in permitting evil to begin with? If God knew the whole thing was gonna happen this way, why did he create this world? Uh, in the first place. And the purpose of evil, the problem can be stated this way. An all good God must have a good purpose for everything. But there is no good purpose for some suffering. For example, useless or innocent suffering. Why little babies uh, die uh, unjustly and little children die of cancer. Uh, hence, there cannot be an all good God. If there were, he wouldn't allow people to throw babies in the air and catch them on bayonets or soldiers to shoot babies in the arms of their mothers and me lies happened in the Vietnam War. Uh, and so there cannot be an all good God. There is either a finite God or no God. Uh, response. Uh, 
Mivrodis, who is a uh, professor, PhD in philosophy, taught at uh, University of Michigan for years and years in the philosophy department, wrote a book on belief in God in which he made this simple distinction. Just because we don't know a good purpose for evil doesn't mean there is none. It doesn't follow to say, I don't know why some evils occur, therefore there is no God. That doesn't follow at all. Because I'm only finite in my knowledge. God is infinite in his knowledge. How can I say, from a finite perspective, that I know more than an infinite God knows from an infinite perspective? Just because I don't know the good purpose doesn't mean there is none. And all good, all knowing God knows a good purpose for everything. He has to. If he's all good, he has to have a good purpose. If he's all knowing, he must know the good purpose. So if he's all good and all knowing, he must know the good purpose for evil, even if I don't. Now, true, some evil seems to me to have no good purpose. We grant that. But all good God has a good purpose for everything. So just because it seems to me not to have a good purpose doesn't mean it doesn't really have a good purpose. So even evil that seems to us to have no good purpose does have a good purpose because an all-knowing and all-good God has it. Why we don't know a good purpose for all evil? Because we don't know everything. We don't know the end of all things. But an all-knowing God knows everything and knows the end of all things. That's why he could say in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but to us and to our children, the things that are revealed. Of course, uh, we don't know everything, but God does. Romans 11, 33 says, his ways are unsearchable and his judgments past finding out. How could we possibly uh, probe the depths of the infinite mind? A famous radio uh, announcer died several years ago. He was on radio maybe 40, 50 years. His name Paul Harvey. He used to have what he called the rest of the story. I knew Paul Harvey personally, and um, one time he uh, went to visit a young man dying of cancer, and he said, I want to encourage a young man. He was only like 26 and dying of cancer. And I came away encouraged because the young man looked at me and said, Paul, I do not believe that the divine architect of the universe ever builds a staircase that leads to nowhere. Now, if there is a divine architect of the universe, all the arguments, the cosmological, teleological, moral arguments that go for saying there's a divine architect of the universe, uh, read The Privileged Planet by Gonzalez. This entire universe, according to the anthropic principle, was fine-tuned or tweaked at the moment of the Big Bang for the emergence of human life. And we're at the best place in the universe to observe that whole thing. Right now, incredible evidence that there's a divine architect of the universe. And if there is a divine architect of the universe, we know one thing for sure. He doesn't build staircases that lead to nowhere. So I see a staircase that looks like it's going to nowhere. Well, that's because I don't see far enough. that there's a divine architect of the universe. And if there is a divine architect of the universe, we know one thing for sure. He doesn't build staircases that lead to nowhere. So I see a staircase that looks like it's going to nowhere. Well, that's because I don't see far enough. Uh, I don't see the rest of the story. Now, we do know that some pain has a good purpose. For example, a warning pain. If I get a sharp pain in my chest, that's a good pain. Reminds me, I better go to the doctor. I might be having a heart attack. If I get a, a very sharp pain in my tooth, I better go to the dentist. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, uh, get a painful extraction from my pocketbook as well as my mouth because I probably need uh, to have the tooth pulled. Uh, what about a pain in the lower right side? Maybe your appendix burst. You might want to have it checked out because you might be dying within a short time. These are good pains, or worse <coughs> pains, and they tell us uh, what we ought to do. So we all know there's some good to pain and some purpose in pain. In fact, 
we learn more through pain than we do through pleasure. I take a survey all over the country and I ask the audience this. How many of you learned some enduring lesson in life through pleasure? Very few people. How many of you learned some enduring lesson in life through pain? A lot of people. I did. I'm, I've almost died seven times. One time I was dying, lying in the hospital, dying of hepatitis. One nice thing about looking on your bed, lying on your back is you can only look one way, uh, up. Uh, and believe me, when you're lying on your back and you're dying, the guy next to me was dying. Uh, the radio came on and Senator McCarthy died of hepatitis, so it was not a cheery day for me. Uh, and believe me, I learned more through that experience than I did all the pleasures that I've had in my life. Why? Because you don't learn many enduring lessons through pleasure. Most of them are learned through pain. C.S. Lewis has this gem in his book, The Problem of Pain. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And he was once an atheist and reasoned his way from atheism, from the problem of evil, back to God. Now I can verify this. You're lying on a beach, the breeze is blowing through the palms, and God is whispering, it's great to be alive. You're buzzing down a road, 75 in a 65 zone, you see a red light in your mirror and you feel a little knot in your stomach. That's uh, called conscience, a little louder. Uh, God speaks in our conscience. You're lying in the hospital dying. Uh, you're all wound up in bandages. God's shouting uh, in our pain. I was lying in the hospital west of uh, Asheville over by Junaluska, uh, dying of uh, sepsis several years ago. Sepsis is uh, not a good thing to have. About half the people get it dying the spot. I woke up in the ER room. There's two things you don't want to hear in the ER room. Oops, or oh no. Well, I woke up in the ER room, vomited up blood, and the doctor said, oh no. He knew what that meant. And uh, I was not. Uh, but God speaks to us in our pain. God teaches us lessons we couldn't learn any other way. Even some pain that has no purpose in itself can be a byproduct of good purpose. This deals with the problem of what's called uh, gratuitous evil. Are there any things that don't have a direct purpose themselves? Yes, uh, but they have a, a, a good by, they're a good byproduct of a good purpose. For example, uh, the uh, blacksmith is using his anvil and sparks fly from it. He's trying to make a plow so the farmer can plow the field and get food feed his family and others, but a spark flies, hits the dust, and burns down the building. That's a bad byproduct of a good process. There are a lot of things in life like that. They're good processes, but some of them have by, bad byproducts. In, in war, we, we uh, 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 call, call those things uh, uh, ancillary. They're different. They're uh, subject to the process itself, uh, but they're not the direct result of the process, they're only a byproduct of the process itself. Note, in each case, there was an overall good purpose in which there was an evil byproduct. So a good physical world like ours with good processes geared to good purposes can have evil byproducts which in themselves are not good. Uh, this happens in war when innocent people are killed, when they're not the direct object of the action that is necessary to take. It happens in a hospital when doctors make mistakes. Uh, it happens uh, uh, many times in life when we have a good uh, thing that we have, water to enjoy, the water skin to swim on, and people can accidentally drown uh, in it. Uh, this is a finite world in which things like that can and do occur. What God does through allowing suffering. Joseph had it right in Genesis 50. His brothers had sold him for dead, <coughs> and he's saving their life. And he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So even 
that some of the evil that is intended as evil has a good byproduct, namely the saving of many lives. The cross itself was a great evil, but look at the byproduct of the cross, Christ, who made salvation possible for everyone. Hebrews 12 says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. I didn't like, I almost dying seven times, I didn't like the pain. But later on, however, it produced a harvest of righteousness. It produces good in our life. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. How much uh, will time be, no matter how long time is, no matter how many thousands of years of human history, how much will that be compared to eternity? But you can't get it between my finger and my thumb. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, uh, Candide was right. Voltaire was right in Candide. This is not the best of all possible worlds. But it may be the best way to the best world, since evil has to be permitted to be defeated. You can't stand outside the ring and say, I'm the greatest. I can be the champion. You gotta get in the ring. God had to permit evil to defeat evil. Permitting evil is necessary to producing higher goods. No courage, no danger. No patience without tribulation. No forgiveness without permitting the sin. Uh, first order evils are necessary to permit in order to produce second order goods. Now I'm not saying beat your head on the wall because it feels so good when you stop. That's promoting evil that good may come. What I am saying, though, is permit yourself to go to the dentist chair so it feels so good when he stops. In other words, you permit evil to achieve the greater good, but you never promote evil to do it. This is not the best of all possible worlds, but it's the best way to the best world. You can't get character without adversity. Many locker rooms have the sign, no pain, no gain. No forgiveness without sin. Now we don't sin that grace may abound, but grace does abound because sin did occur. The best way to the best world. This is not the best world possible, but God is the best being possible. And the best being possible must accomplish the best end possible. But this world is the best way to the best end the best world. Therefore, making this world was, was, with its evil was the best way to achieve the best world possible. Let's put it this way. We wouldn't be surprised as Christians if when we met our master, he said something like this. I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. It's not easy, but it is worth it. Put it this way, we wouldn't be surprised as Christians if when we met our master, he said something like this. I never said it would be easy. I only said it would be worth it. It's not easy, but it is worth it. You say, well, what about hell? Is it worth it for the people uh, who went to hell? You're talking about the people who go to heaven, that's one thing, but people who are separated and to the eternal fire, what about them? C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, following what Jesus said, has a profound line. Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And remember, it's a free universe. And people don't have to go God's way. But God has to respect their freedom. He has to allow them to do their own thing. But he can't allow them to mess up the freedom of someone else. So there has to be a place. Like, for example, uh, in this world, we have places where people want to smoke and smoke. We don't want them to blow the smoke in our face, but they have the right to smoke. In eternity, there has to be a smoke <coughs> in a non-smoking section. Because they can't blow their smoke in our face, and we can't. Uh, forbid them the possibility of smoking, as it were. Uh, 
So if you were not willing, I couldn't force you against your will. C.S. Lewis said it this way, the whole book, The Great Divorce, which is about uh, heaven and hell, not about marriage. This is the best line. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous uh, French uh, existentialist atheist, wrote a play titled uh, No Exit. In the middle of the play, the door of hell opens. There's three people in hell. In the middle of the play, the door of hell opens, and they're all allowed to leave. Just an atheist. There's a profound understanding of hell, and nobody leaves. Why? Because we're condemned to our own freedom. Because the door of hell is locked on the inside, not the outside. Because there are only two kinds of people in this universe and two kinds of people in this room. Either you're going to say to God, thy will be done. Or one day, you're going to hear him say, have it your will. Thy will be done. Milton in Paradise Lost puts these words in the mouth of Satan. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And I wrote in the margin of my book, you've got it, sign God. It's exactly the way it is in a free universe. Well, we have a lot more things we could discuss, but uh, let me stop there and give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, a lot more is in our book, If God, Why Evil? I We'll skip the first question, because nobody <laughs> wants to ask that. We'll go to the second question. Yeah, I, I've got a question. Um, but I'm trying to think of how I can... Do you ever have difficulty when you're talking to, uh, to somebody who doesn't believe in God, using an argument saying... You, basically, you're proving your argument by going back to the nature of God. Do they ever have an issue with the fact that the, the proof of your argument is the thing that they're trying to disprove? Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course they do. That's why I alluded to uh, the evidence for God, the cosmological, teleological, okay, right. moral arguments, and said that uh, that's another topic for another night. But uh, you, yeah, you, you, uh, you need to uh, prove give evidence that God exists, and the evidence that God exists is also the evidence for the answer to the problem of evil. Secondly, you don't have to do that. You can just start the way we did and say, uh, is the existence of evil compatible with an all-good, uh, all-loving, uh, all-powerful God? And so you can think of everything I said tonight as, uh, did we show that there is a consistency between being all loving and all good and evil existing? And, and then bypass the whole question of uh, does that God exist? The question is simply is it consistent to believe that? Uh, and I think the answer is yes because no one has showed that there is a contradiction, a logical contradiction to, in believing there is an all good, all powerful God and evil, not if evil is understood as a privation, coming from free will, da 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 da, which we uh, try to show tonight. Good question. Anything else? I think it's uh, worthy to note that the atheist's best argument against God, in fact, really boils down to it, the atheist only has one real argument against God, and that is it can't be a God or there wouldn't be all this evil in the world. But he hasn't proven that. In fact, his argument presupposes there is a God, because he couldn't even know that there was evil in this world unless there was an absolute standard of good and an absolute moral lawgiver. So he has to presuppose God to make his argument even work. I debated an atheist once, and I confronted him with that dilemma, and I wondered what he was going to say. And uh, he was very frank and very honest. He said, I'm not presupposing any absolute moral standard. 
Uh, the only reason I have for not believing in God is, quote, my own benign moral feeling. And I, and I said to my friends, what if I had gotten up there and said, as a Christian, the only reason I have for believing in God is my own benign moral feeling, they would have laughed me off the platform, right? That's not a reason, your own benign moral feeling. It's not a reason. That's a good question. Okay, so for the uh, atheist side, uh, the argument is that to a state that evil will never be here, uh, you would have to be annoyed. You would have to know that. Um, well, doesn't that apply the other way? That if you say that one day it will be, yet have not happen, then the same goes for you. You would have to know everything. You would have to know that that would also have to happen. Yeah, you mean we would have to know everything? Well, in the same way that we are certain that that will never happen, we have to know everything, according to your argument, then the same way goes for you, being a certain that one day it will have to happen. No, you have to know that there is someone who knows everything. You don't have to be the one. And this person will be God, or this entity yeah. will be God. Yeah. So it all goes back down to faith. Yeah. No, it does go back to faith. Uh, uh, because what you're saying here, he, he's, give, he's proposing an argument against there being an all-good and all-powerful God, right? Uh, forget about proof for God or whether there's evidence for God to exist, but uh, is it incompatible to believe God is all-good and all-powerful uh, and there's evil in this world? And we're saying, no, it's not, because his argument amounts to saying evil is not yet defeated. And evil might one day be defeated. And if he says uh, the second argument, well, evil never will be defeated, I have every right to know on what grounds he thinks it never will be defeated. Where did he get that now? And what's the basis for knowing that? See, uh, we, we, have a, we have a basis when pressed for a basis for knowing that an all-good, all-powerful God exists. We have a cosmological, teleological, moral argument uh, to show uh, evidence for that uh, God. He doesn't have any uh, such basis. We have the, you know, the Big Bang and the anthropic principle and specified complexity and, and irreducible complexity and first life and all of those scientific evidences. What evidence does he have? The atheist only really has one uh, good argument. It's a negative one and the negative one boomerangs. The negative one doesn't work because either he has a yet in it uh, he was not yet defeated, and he's assuming it ever can be, or he has to assume uh, the standpoint of omniscience and say, I know it never will be. Any, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, well, um, on the next little thing is the evil defeated from Move on. On the next couple slides is you have your seed being being evil will be defeated one day. Mm -hmm. The question that a atheist, whatever he would say, is why is he waiting? Why hasn't he done it already? If he can and he will. Well, I, I separated that remember into two things because it's pretty clear that what Christ did did not yet do away with all evil in the world. That's not yet been completed. Uh, he, and from a biblical standpoint, he has two covenants, one for the cross and one for the crown. And it won't be until he comes back where he actually does away with all evil by separating good and evil, uh, the wheat and the tares, and uh, punishing evil and rewarding good in heaven. So I think, I think it's really the common sense and scripture tell us that uh, <coughs> evil may have been officially defeated by what Christ did, but it's not been actually done away with yet. If it, if it has, uh, then we are already living in the best of all possible worlds, and my response to that is, uh, <laughs> like a Candide. Read Candide. If you ever read Candide, it's a satire on uh, life in this best of all possible worlds. Uh, Voltaire, and the, the, all these incredible things happen. He said, oh, but this is the best of all possible worlds. He just just rubs it in uh, to say that this world as it now is, is the best of all possible worlds. I mean, I can improve it. One less lie, one less rape, one less murder, uh, tomorrow would make it a better world, right? So it's clearly not the best of all possible 
uh, worlds. But according to the Bible and according to human expectation, there is coming a world that is uh, the best of all possible worlds, and that's when evil <coughs> is banished, evil is separated from good. Uh, God says, thy will be done, thy will be done. Everybody uh, is happy because I don't have any more uh, evil to frustrate my good desires. The evil people don't have any more good to frustrate their evil desires. Uh, and everybody has it according to their will. Yes, wait a minute. Why do you say that there's a, a separation between the official defeat of people and the actual defeat? Biblically, there's a separation between the first and second coming. Historically and biblically, the first coming, Christ did come, die, and rise from the dead. So clearly, he, he defeated evil in some sense. In the passages in Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2, he defeated death, he defeated the devil. But also, clearly, it's not uh, completely defeated because people are still dying. So that won't be taken care of until the final resurrection, when everybody's resurrected, and that hasn't happened. Uh, and there hasn't been a separation of good from evil. There hasn't been any... Uh, get, getting evil out of my face and getting good out of their uh, face, it hasn't happened yet, uh, either biblically or experientially. Yeah? Um, so, um, when the separation of good and evil happens after the second coming, mm -hmm. um, at that point, will there be in, in heaven the opportunity for people to, um, uh, I guess, claim their own will and, and manifest evil? And no. And, and there's good biblical and logical reasons for that. The biblical reasons are clear. That's a point that man wants to die and after this, the judgment. There's a great gulf fixed between the two. There's no evidence anyone can pass from one side uh, to the other. Just think about it. What is it that keeps people in their path now? What keeps, what keeps evil people uh, in doing evil? And what is it that frustrates them? What frustrates them is uh, light. There's <coughs> darkness. What's going to happen when there's no more light and they're in total darkness? They're going to want even less to do good. When there's no more common grace or special grace, no more Christians witnessing, no more Bible, uh, they're being uh, heard, no more uh, salt and light in society. So once all of those good things are taken out of the way that are frustrating evil people from doing evil and they're unhampered whatsoever by any good, uh, then they're going to want to do evil even more so than they do now. And then likewise for good people, what frustrates me? Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, when I get rid of the flesh, the old nature, the tendency to evil, uh, then the good can uh, reign in my life and the good can come forward and I'll not be hampered by the evil. Yes. Yeah. I think I'm going back to the nature of evil, the, the first part that you talked about where um, you, you said that God gave us a free will and then later you said that um, you can't redeem on what they've given us. Right. And so I, I feel like when we're in heaven after the second coming, then there's this opportunity, there's still free will there. Um, and so can we not at that point will our own will, you know, choose good, our own will? Good question. No, evil... Uh, Heaven is to earth what marriage is to courtship. You've got a time to make up your mind, but once you say, I'm talking about Christian biblical marriage now, not uh, uh, the, uh, uh, till the next fight do we part, or till death do we part. Uh, once you say, and forsaking all others, I cling only to you the rest of my life, you made your choice. Now, what happened when I got married, uh, 57 years ago, by the way, I was five. I was five. <laughs> what happened when I got married is it separated me from every other woman in the world. My dating life just came to a screeching halt. No, no one's ever called me again. Of course, nobody called me before either, but uh, <laughs> no, nobody's ever called me again. Why? Because I made a decision. I want to be with her till death do us part. And God rewarded by decision by the bonds of marriage. Heaven will be the eternal reward of the decision we make here. 
they'll be rewarded by the bonds of being brought together, God, and then being separated from evil. Now, here's the trick. The highest kind of freedom is not the freedom to do evil. It's the freedom from evil. We have the freedom to do evil, to choose whether we want to get the freedom from evil. That's the freedom that God has. God has freedom, but he doesn't have the freedom to do evil. It's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, 18, God who cannot lie, Titus 1, 2, and so forth. So just as God has freedom, but it's freedom from evil, when we get to heaven, we're going to have freedom. The highest freedom possible, just like God's. Freedom from doing all evil, not the freedom to do evil. Yeah, so here. Uh, so way back when, uh, when before humanity, you know, we had angels and Lucifer was there. Back then, there was no evil and any of that. Was Lucifer back then free from evil, or not really? Okay, way back when, uh, before Adam. They were created when there was just angels created, Lucifer hadn't yet sinned. Uh, when he had the good guy, good environment, good angels, uh, he had the freedom to do evil, but he hadn't yet exercised it. As soon as he exercised that uh, freedom, he was solidified in that. Now that's a tougher question, a little longer, but uh, to answer, because angels by their nature can't change. That's why the minute they make their decision, it's over. It's like death to us. We have a lifetime to make a decision. They have an instant to make a decision. And they, once he made his decision, he was solidified in that forever, permanently. Uh, so after Christ's second coming, we do not have that option. We do not have that. Uh, because once you see an infinite good, it's like Plato. Uh, who had the agathos, the good in his system, and the good was, you know, if you came out of the cave and you saw the good, uh, once you see the good, the sun, you'll never want to uh, turn back again. Once you see an infinite good, it's called the beatific vision, you'll never want to turn from it. It would be like the most beautiful painting you ever saw. You'd just be kind of stupefied with the uh, beauty, uh, hypnotized by it. Uh, we'll be hypnotized by the absolute good that we chose to see. Now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we'll know even as we are known. The servant shall see his face. Remember, Moses couldn't see his face, because once you see the face of God, the beatific vision directly, an infinite good, then you're, you're incapable of doing evil from that point on. How did Lucifer choose evil? Yeah. How did he what? If Lucifer had seen God, how did he choose? He hadn't, he hadn't seen the eternal vision before he chose. That's what he had to choose to do. Okay. Some people, have, uh, when I'm talking to them, they'll deny the existence of evil and they'll instead refer to it as a mistake. And I've, I've responded to that and but I would just like to hear how you would, you know, the best response to that kind of thing, where they just say, oh, if somebody didn't do evil, they just did a mistake. Like, My first response is, then don't let me hear you complain again that there's no God because there's evil in this world. That's my first response to them. I don't want to hear any more out of you. If there's no evil, then let's not use it against God. Let's not say, catching babies on bad or anything. And uh, stop them right uh, dead in their tracks because they want to have it both ways. They want to say, oh, there's real evil when they're arguing against God, but it's just a mistake uh, when we're doing it. Furthermore, uh, I want to know whether, whether they think it's a mistake when somebody does it on them. I don't want them to say, well, I think it's all right to steal. I want them, when they worked hard and, and bought their new sports car, and, and uh, you steal that, I want to see their reaction. Because you don't tell what people really believe by their actions. We're all hypocrites. You tell it by their reactions when it happens to them. And I want to see so when somebody steals their wife, or their car, or their home, how they react, that shows what they really believe. Uh, read uh, the closely American mind. 
um, by by uh, Bloom? Bloom? Alan Bloom. It's Alan Bloom, I think, is it? Yeah. Closing American Mind. He was a Jewish classicist, taught at University of Chicago, a very liberal school. Uh, he translated Plato, Rousseau, had impeccable credentials, and he wrote this book called The Closing American Mind about 1985. And uh, in it he said, well, you know, I had all these liberal students in my class, and they didn't believe there was any, anything which was really evil, so I asked them this question. If you were part of the British protectorate in India, and you were in charge of a little province where they were still cremating the wife when the husband died, they would kill the wife and cremate her, because what can she do? She didn't have a husband, right? It's a yeah, and it's, it's, it's a horrid practice. He said, would you put a stop to the practice? It's a good question. This class was dead silent. They didn't want to answer. Why? Because they're caught. They really know deep down that there's something wrong, but their culture told them, don't cram your morals down somebody else's throat, you know? So they're caught. So they ask him again, would you put an end to the practice when the husband dies and cremating the wife? No answer. So he asked him the third time. Somebody said, the British shouldn't have been there. That's not the question. <laughs> It's not the question. Is it right or wrong to cremate a wife just because her husband died? They had, they, everybody has what J. Bujicevsky, who was a former atheist who became a Christian by the problem of evil, by the way, uh, and reasoned his way out of it, teaching at the University of Texas, uh, he calls it a baloney meter. Everybody has a baloney meter down inside. Is it right to throw out babies in the air and catch them on bayonets? Well, I mean, some people do that. And, nah, the old baloney meter goes on. So. You know, is it right to, uh, to commit the mass genocide on the Jewish race? Nah, the baloney meter comes on. Uh, my favorite atheist to debate over the years, and I debated for about 25 years with atheists and, on the university campus, my favorite atheist to debate was a Jewish atheist, because I never met a Jewish atheist who didn't believe the Holocaust was really evil. It wasn't just his opinion. They all knew it was really evil, especially what's going to happen on you and, uh, and your people. So I use both of those. Anything else? All right, very good. Thanks for pushing. I'll be around later.